let's go ahead. Group D, lots of happenings. Some surprises. Where do you want to get started, Group D? I mean, we got four great teams in Group D as well, but let's start with Chelsea hacking. We got to start with the Blues. One big takeaway from this match, I just felt like Chelsea looked a little tired. I don't know how to explain it more than that. But then I think BK Hacken's goalkeeper, Jennifer Falk, did her part to keep Hacken at the top of this group. I'll just put it simply, aside from saying I think Chelsea looked tired, they couldn't do a damn thing in the final third. Their finishing didn't look great. The touch didn't look like it was there in that match. And that's going to happen. You increase your margin for error when you have, oh, I don't know, seven elite players on the field at all times, kind of like Chelsea has. But sometimes it's not cooking for, for anybody out there at least anybody who's constantly involved in the attack. We'll talk about some Chelsea players who I thought played really well. The Blues had around 70% possession. They attempted 22 shots, but only five of them were on goal, which I think bears out just from the eye test of like, "Eh, it just doesn't feel like the final touch was there. Sam Kerr didn't look awesome. And that's just going to happen. These players aren't robots. She's one of the best players in the world. I think one of my favorite moments of the match, right around the 60th minute, she has a header off a corner kick, and it's a pretty clean header. Her header goes just over the bar, and the camera pans into her face just in time for the close-up to see her go, fuck off, <laughs> after she <laughs> heads it over the bar, which I think was a pretty good encapsulation of her form throughout the match. As for players for Chelsea who played really well, Neem Charles, Chelsea's stalwart left back, was a menace throughout the match, Mm -hmm. winning the ball, forcing turnovers, pushing the ball down the field, down the wing, as she's wont to do fairly often. She was jumping off the screen at some points where I was like, okay, if Canared and Kerr aren't winning the game for you, Neem Charles might have been the best player on the pitch for Chelsea in this match. And so shout out to her because that was just fantastic. But I do not only want to talk about Chelsea. I don't want to only look at this from the English lens. I thought Hacken did a lot of great things. I mentioned Jennifer Falk at the top. I think she was pretty much the main reason this draw happened. She had a crucial save. She came off her line at the perfect time in the 11th minute. Again, we talk about how these early goals completely changed the complexion of these matches. She comes off the line in the 11th minute and completely smothers girl Wrighton. And I'm just going to say, I know Wrighton's coming off a long layoff with her injury. If Wrighton has a clean look there, you have to like her chances. And so Falk's intuition to come off the line real quickly, real instinctively, and smother that I thought was gigantic. Falk had some other good to very good saves. After halftime in the 59th minute, Johanna Canared is 1v1 with the keeper. And as you and I talk about like these elite players, you always like your chances in those circumstances. And Falk yep. had a kick save with just great flexibility, great instincts, and was able to keep it nil-nil. Let me shout out, because obviously you give credit to the keeper. Even if Chelsea wasn't in top form in the final third, you got to give credit to Hacken's back four for at least making it tougher on them. Like, we're not going to let you just rip shots. Hacken's back four, in order, from left to right. Elman Elledge, Ivy Lewick, Josephine Rybrink, and Katarina Casola. They had a great defensive shell. They made sure that if you're a dangerous player, I'm getting the foot up. I'm charging you as you're going to try to rip this shot. They made them at least a little more difficult. I think Rybrink, Josephine Rybrink, every match, she does like two or three things that make me go, mm, real good. (laughs) Like like she just has those moments (laughs) where she's just like in the right spot. She can get like a classy toe poke in there sometimes just to like kind of fuck up the attacking player's rhythm. She just does great stuff. Feels like every match I watch. And for anybody who paid attention to uh, us when we were covering the Women's World Cup, I have a a U.S. Women's National Team fan in my life who often speaks about her tall girl bias. Uh, She stands five foot ten. It's my lovely wife. Just admit that. As a tall girl herself, she refers to her tall girl bias. Elma Nellage stands at five foot ten. And in set piece defending, she's absolutely crucial for Hacken. So credit to Hacken, forcing the draw, finding the draw, if you will, depending on how long you've uh, listened to me and Tino you know, podcast about some things. Ew. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Lauren James comes onto the pitch and immediately looks like the best player and has an incredible step over move, hits mm-hmm. a low shot in the 90th minute that I was like, this is it. This is happening right now. It's going to be a heartbreaker for Hacken. But Falk gets another save. It was worthy. It's a point for each team. And I think that's what the result should have been. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit it. I thought Chelsea's start a little bit lax. The yep. commentator mentioned that they looked a little lackadaisical. Sam Kerr kind of specifically had a high tendency early to kind of have some lazy passes get intercepted pretty yep. easily. And what I saw was... The slow start combined with 
Hacken's defense turn into a little bit of impatience. And then that impatience last third of the game turned into straight frustration, you know? So it kind of compounds on itself when you don't start super sharp and then you start to be like, oh, but we're supposed to be up. We're supposed to go to halftime. Like, let's get one. Let's get one. Let's get one. And then you don't get one. And then what do you go to? You know, now you're in the last third of the game and now you've got to look to subs. I was shocked to see no Lauren James in the starting lineup. I mean, I thought Girl Wrighton was awesome. So, you know, she's kind of got to be there. We talked last week about Lauren James kind of maybe taking on more of like a centerpiece kind of playmaking kind of role. I thought they really could have used some of that. Yeah. She's just so good and so electric. Just have to find a place for her on the field somehow. Like she was (laughs) definitely the most likely to score from the minute she stepped on the, you know, first blade of grass. No doubt. And I just thought game plan was a little weird for Chelsea. Energy might have been a little low. I agree with that. And once you get off on the wrong foot, they maybe tried to press a little bit too much. About two thirds into the match, like I mentioned, I jotted down in my notes. I'm like, holy shit, this one's going to finish nil nil. (laughs) <laughs> and Hackett's nice. going to be be at the top of the group for another week. And then the rematch, like we mentioned, this one's going to be played at Gothenburg. And now if you're Chelsea going on the road for this one, they're not going to be afraid, you know, under any circumstance. Nope. But there's going to be a little something in the back of their mind. That's the great benefit of the quick pivot that you mentioned, where we get yep. these back to back. You know, Hackett's got to be feeling great having gone to Stanford Bridge, taken a point, locked them completely down. And now they're going home. I mean, the vibe's going to be pretty good, I have to imagine, <laughs> for that Hacken side. This one's going to be awesome. Yeah, I think there's going to be a great crowd. I think we talked about a couple episodes that Hacken had a great environment in one of their home matches earlier in the group stage. It seems like a pretty compact arena, like a sensible number of seats in there that they could fill pretty easily. And yeah, I mean, they get to turn around. They say, okay, now we get a home match. Exactly the point you made. They get a draw at Stamford Bridge. But I think also they get to say, we'll just try to beat this team up again. Our season is over. Chelsea had to play Brighton. Today, I think this morning as we record this on Sunday. So yeah, let's take another hack at them, pun absolutely intended. Nice. What you mentioned about Laura James, and we have danced around it. We have talked directly about it, about her being the number 10 on this team and being your focal point of the offense at all time. And I think part of that is because me and you love, love, love her style of play. We like any athlete who kind of is able to control the chess pieces on the board, but then also score for themselves and do all that kind of stuff. And now we're down to player management. Because like you said, girl right and looked great on the left-hand side. And you can always play, I mean, you could play LJ anywhere really on the pitch. But you put in girl right and she's getting back into form. You kind of have to manage that and make sure that you don't make the impression to write and like, hey, you kind of lost your spot after your injury. You don't want to do that. Fran Kirby is working back from an injury also. And so she's the one who got the start kind of in that number 10 role. Fran Kirby is widely considered one of the best number 10s in the world. And so now you just have these pieces that Emma Hayes has. It's a good problem to have, I suppose. And I don't know what Lauren James' rest situation is, or I'd imagine they have some kind of schedule and all that stuff. So I thought like, maybe that's why you're resting LJ in this spot. Like when she wasn't on the team sheet, like at least in the starting 11. But like you said, you got a nuclear weapon there that you could place in your midfielder on the left-hand side, on the left wing, anytime you want. You probably want her in the match in a Champions League game. You know, we talked about Sam Kerr, talked about Frank Kirby, Go Wrighton, all excellent players. But Lauren James is like sort of on track to be like generational great, you know, not just great for this team (laughs) this season. Like you might have, again, to call back a little bit NBA parallels, you might have Jokic at 22 years old on your team. So while it is a task to try to kind of like reorganize the chess pieces, I can't imagine that it's a rest thing because who did you say they had this week? Uh, Brighton? Yes. Yeah, maybe she can rest for that one. (laughs) And I also took a look at the standings of the Champions League. So Chelsea still has this match at Hacken, and they have another match at Paris FC. Mm -hmm. And Paris FC is two points behind them in the standings. Mm -hmm. So if Chelsea go to Paris and lose, now Chelsea's in the third spot. So this group very very much up for grabs Real Madrid is the only one in the tough spot with just a single point but Paris FC's on three Chelsea's on five Hackens at seven I don't know a little bit of the like U.S. Women's National Team vibes where it's like oh you know can't disrupt the apple cart too much but I mean you get like you said she's a fucking nuclear weapon and I don't know maybe you wipe the whiteboard down and you know LJ first James. Kerr first LJ second <laughs> and then you figure out the rest right like I don't understand why that's not the play 
but yeah. there's still a lot of time, like we mentioned, just halfway through the group stage. So this is like the chess match within the chess match that we're excited about. And again, these two teams go back at it next week. Because I care about journalism and as we say, we like accuracy. My bad. I raised my hand, uh, call my own foul on this one. They played Bristol City this morning, which actually lends itself even more to your point because Bristol City is bottom of the table in the WSL. Chelsea defeated Bristol City 3-0. Lauren James scored in the 17th minute. So yeah, so, you know, maybe could have rested her for this one. And let me just give a give a shout out to her because I, <laughs> I fucking love the way she plays. But Aaron Cuthbert, the Scottish midfielder yeah. for Chelsea, also got on the score sheet today versus Bristol. What a fucking bulldozer she is. I just love what a Scottish archetype player to have on the squad who is just throwing shoulders, knocking people around, hit a rocket of a shot that looked like it was going to take the lead. And it's just a little unlucky, bangs off the crossbar and doesn't careen it over the line. But yeah, I think Aaron Cuthbert, every time I watch her play, I get great joy from it. I think it might have been the Real Madrid match where she took a head to the face and just immediately had a giant fucking shiner that made Emma Hayes be like, oh, Jesus. And because <laughs> because Aaron Cuthbert is Scottish and she's a professional athlete, just like waves everybody off like, whatever, I'm still playing. <laughs> so that toughness is going to pay dividends. But I think you're right, man. Like who saw Hacken? And Hacken's not a bullshit team by any stretch, but we're into this thing. We're three matches in and they're sitting at the top of the group and they got a home match coming up. You got to feel awesome about that. Never lost. Two wins no. and a draw. So here we go. Damn right. Let's scoot ahead. Paris FC, Real Madrid. <laughs> Let me clear out. <laughs> I found I found you at the top of the key, and I'm just going to go stay in the corner. Paris FC, not here for play play. They came out. <laughs> they came out. What a great strategy. They just came out off rip from the tunnel. We're like, we're going to play direct. We're going to run right at you. You have some of the best defenders in the world, Real Madrid. You have world champions on the squad. Your captains are genius players. We don't give a fuck. We're in Paris. We're playing right at you over the top. And they just hit him with the two haymakers right away. Two-piece. Yes. The crowd energy was great. Julie DeFore is just out here winning balls off of defenders. Let's get right into it. Paris FC, they score in the fourth minute. Julie DeFore starts the whole thing by winning a ball against what felt like three players in the Real Madrid midfield. She keeps it going. She muscles up. Real Madrid is trying to play the ball back in very typical Real Madrid style and just like, okay, let's play it back. We'll get it to the keeper. But Julie DeFore, not here for that. Muscles up over Ivana Andres, <laughs> just takes the ball from her and scores in the fourth minute. And again, we're talking about Ivana Andres, the captain of the squad, a World Cup champion, a world class player. Bodied. Bodied. I just think about, uh, I know I've mentioned it, it's such a random thing, but again, I'll, I'll make the basketball comparison. There's a great commercial when the Kevin Garnett Celtics were around where you hear. Kevin Garnett with like his super growly voice where he's talking about the team and he goes, we let the defense set the tone. <laughs> and I just, <laughs> I just love that attitude. And that's how it felt like Paris FC was just like, we're pressing you. We don't fucking care. Like we run the press. If you would have switched the jerseys and Paris FC was wearing the Real Madrid jerseys, I would have believed that was a Real Madrid team playing in those yep. shirts. I just yep. cannot say enough about how much I love the, just the general attitude Less than two minutes later, they play super direct. They play a ball over the top. Matilda Bordeaux, she plays a cross in, takes a bit of an unlucky bounce off the Madrid defender, but it falls to Gatan Thine, who has a super clever finish just to poke the ball, just a nice little tap, tap, tap it in. Gets it past the keeper, Maria Rodriguez. We're sitting at 2 0. Six minutes into this football match. Crazy. Where's your head when you see this? All I could think about was last week talking about which team this was going to be the scary hours or the super scary hours for. <laughs> That's yes. immediately where my head went. And I'm just like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> If you're Real Madrid, I mean, I was expecting like the Olga Carmona game. I thought it was going to be right. Olga time. And I was like, all right, backs against the wall. They got to make it happen. They're on one point. Yeah, they're going to Paris. But I mean, it's, it's Real Madrid. And I was like, whoa, they got smacked all of this happened before their cafecitos kicked in so they're, they're still kind of you know they're still kind of like stretch it they're still kind of like you know doing some of these and there's like all right let's uh, you know like and it's it's already two nil and they're on the road and they're against a team like you said that they want to set the tone they want to create starting from the defense so you already knew what time it was it was going to be a tough day for las blancas 
For sure. And I thought the camera typically in these matches, from what I've noticed, after a goal is scored, they typically do immediately, fairly soon after, they go to the wide shot. And when they go to the wide angle shot after that goal, you can see Madrid is in a full 11 huddle right after that. Mm -hmm. Like, I would imagine Olga Carmona, speaking of what we thought uh, would be an Olga Carmona game, I'm going to guess she had some choice words for everybody in that moment. I just have a hunch that she was probably not thrilled with the effort up to that point, you know, in my notes, as I'm watching the game live, I still, even then, I'm like, you got to think they're going to get their shit together. And, and pull it. like, I know it looks terrible. And maybe I'm just having a moment where I'm just looking at the name Real Madrid. And I have some Champions League scars from other rooting interests that I have, but I'm just looking at them like, okay, they're not going to get blown out here. And they didn't. But I will just say so much credit to Paris FC for coming out there, not afraid for even a millisecond. I thought something was pretty gross though and in the 10th minute Madrid has a corner kick and it comes in and it's right around the six yard box in a position in front of the goal there are no Las Blancas standing there and the keeper just kind of just collects it I think there's like a little there's like a, a hiccup of a miscommunication between the defender and the keeper but she corrals it and I'm just sitting there like where is everybody (laughs) <laughs> like what? Like where are Las Blancas? I need I need to know. Like you should be there. It was at a position, and I just thought that was like. Speaking of you mentioning the cafecito not kicking in yet, I was just like, yo, somebody has to be standing at the six yard box in front of the goal. I would appreciate that on a corner kick. So I thought that was that was a little symbolic of kind of how the match started for him. There was a nervy moment for Paris FC. I can't remember which defender it was, but she plays the ball back to Inadozi in the 16th minute with the Madrid attacker standing right next to her. And uh, Inadozi, because she is so strong and so like quick-witted out there, that she's able to kind of like at least get a touch on it and then turn the attacking player away from the goal. But you can tell by a look on her face, she's like, don't fucking pass me the ball while I have an attacker standing right next to me, please. <laughs> I thought it's not going to help. We talk about in a dozy. This is a pro in a dozy podcast since the yep. Women's World Cup. Uh, when she played for the Super Falcons. She had a great kick save in the 27th minute. And then later, uh, shortly after that, a minute after that, there is an obvious handball by uh, veteran Julie Sawyer. And now we have Olga coming to the spot in the 28th minute. And I'm like, okay, this is the Madrid that I was fearing. And obviously, Carmona's going to bury this because that's who she is. That's what she does. Not today, sir. Fucking in a dozy. Everything about it. The anticipation... The right guess, you know, obviously there's a bit of reading on the penalty kick, but you're largely guessing as a goalkeeper, especially when you have Carmona taking it and you know she's going to blast it. So you kind of have to guess the length of her dive, like the way she's able to like propel herself off the ground. She launches Mm -hmm. herself to the left and then the hand strength to keep that laser out of there. That's my motherfucking goalkeeper right there. I fucking love watching her play. I mean, she stared down Olga and she's like, (laughs) we're going to skate to one song and one song only. (laughs) I thought with the save that she got on it, I was like, oh, Olga must have kind of flubbed it or threw a cupcake (laughs) at her. But it was a legit strike in the like pretty well placed. So Anadozi just made a play. And like at that point. I want to rewind a little bit because yeah. I wanted to just reiterate what Julie DeFore did to Ivana Andres on the first mm-hmm. goal. <laughs> yes. Like, I mean, just absolutely a ball that DeFore had no business getting to. She's at a total disadvantage as the ball's rolling. And she just, I mean, Reggie White just, just like, <laughs> like just swooped yeah. around and like knocked Andres off of her path and then just buries the finish. That's got to rock your confidence as a Madrid player. You know, I'm not surprised that a couple minutes later, they were in a players only meeting on the field to try to <laughs> you know, pull it together. But I think that really did rock them just because that was a ferocious play from DeFore. And then for, for Tine to come back a couple of minutes later, and like you said, kind of slick it in. Yeah. Just be like, oh, I got a little shot here. Bop, bop, bop. You know, and now it's like, damn, they're beating us <laughs> every kind of way <laughs> at that point. <laughs> And then once Inadozi stares Olga down, gets the save, I mean, they were going to go through the motions and Madrid was still going to get chances and, you know, we're going to kind of play out the string. But I mean, it's hard for all 11 to keep that same top level intensity, which is kind of what we're seeing it takes to kind of win these matches. And credit to Puri FC for just staying at that level kind of all the way through. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that's a really good way to put it. Like they stayed at that level. They weren't naive, though. Like they knew they played like mm-hmm. we're playing great but we still know 
Real Madrid is going to get their chances. So we just have to make mm-hmm. sure we keep the defensive shell and make those chances as difficult as possible. And speaking of those like kind of chances that you know Real Madrid is going to get. So Haley Rosso, she has an explosive run with the ball down the right flank. She fires in across right in the path of Danish Caroline Muller Hansen, who had no choice but to score that goal. Like the pass is so goddamn perfect. And all she has to do is slide, literally just slide into the ball, into the path of the ball. And it's it's going to be a rocket right into the back of the net. And that's at 54 minutes, not long after halftime. And again, I don't know if I'm just looking at the jerseys, but I'm just like, okay, we got ourselves a football game here. Like at that moment, I, I won't even lie. Even with Paris FC playing so great, I thought 3-2 Madrid is on the board. Wow. Because, you know, there's just so much quality. But honestly, that kind of got squashed within the next 10 minutes because what you had mentioned kind of really started to dawn on me is it's like, yeah, Paris FC, they're just going to be tough out here. They're going to play physical. They're not going to let anything be easy. The crowd is behind them. They're passing the ball around. They're not afraid to hold the ball a little bit, but they're not obsessed with trying to hold the ball and playing with it too much down like, and their own end. Exactly what you said earlier. They kept that energy and they kept a sense of urgency in their passing well enough to, even though I believe Madrid had a a little bit of an edge in the possession battle, it wasn't all underdog football. It wasn't all counterattack football. It was a pretty even match throughout the game and they had plenty of moments on the front foot and it was just kind of back and forth. You had some chances, none that were like any like howlers or anything like that. And you end up walking away with a 2-1 home victory. Yeah, really interesting parallels between both Paris teams. Both go up 2-0, give up a goal to a good team. Now game on for the last 30, 40 minutes, but both come out victorious 2-1. So pretty cool to see. All right, man, I think we did it. Group C, Group D in the books. This has been another episode of Into the Channel. Follow us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to watch or listen. Ratings and reviews always appreciated at ITC underscore pod on X, at Into the Channel pod on threads. Huge thank you to my co-host, Mr. Grant Engel, for showing up on the first leg of the tie. We've got some more coming up. Stay tuned for that. Thanks again, man. Yeah, buddy. Thank you. I'll see you at the rematches.